Well, welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. Rev 250 is a consortium of about 70 groups in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the beginnings of the American Revolution. And I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group. And today we have with us Bruce Moday, Mauday, who is an author from Chester County, Pennsylvania. He's written 16 books, I think, by my count. And today we're here to talk about his latest one, which is Lafayette at Brandywine, The Making of an American Hero. Bruce, thanks for joining us. Bob, thank you so much. I was so glad to, that you asked me to join you today. Lafayette is just a great character in our American history, and actually one that um, Americans owe a lot to, and, and I think today a lot of people don't realize what all he did to help us become free uh, right. in the battle against Great Britain. Right, and so your book really does tell the story of the moment when Lafayette goes from being simply a volunteer observer to being an active participant in the revolution. But they, that's that's true. If you, if you kind of back up to September the 11th, 1777, and that was the date of the Battle of the Brandywine, if you look that morning, um, Lafayette was not being paid. He's a volunteer on George Washington's staff. Frankly, not anybody really knew him very much. I know a few people within the army. He was not commanding any troops, even though he wanted to. Um, yeah, he was given a commission and outranked a lot of the generals on Washington staff, and they weren't very happy with him because of that, because here's this kid who on the day of the battle had just turned 20 years old. Mm. He was 19 when he came over. He spoke a little bit of English. Um, and, you know, he, they, he outranked them. So, he, you know, he wasn't a great you know, fan favorite there. And he really had only been affiliated with uh, the George Washington's army since the beginning of August. So that was about six weeks before the battle. Mm -hmm. You know, he spent a lot of the morning, we can talk a little bit about this, you know, on Washington's staff along with uh, Hamilton and others. And, you know, they were fighting as best as they could, the British army. And, um, so if you go to the early afternoon, he was just another European officer uh, that George Washington right before that said he didn't win anymore. And, yeah. and the Continental Congress almost sent him home yeah. in the beginning of August because he was exactly what Washington didn't want. So you, you had him there in the morning and you know, he, was, he was just another soldier yes. on Washington's staff. Yeah. So, so there had been a Washington had had a problem with these French officers who came over expecting they were going to run the show. And well, they were it, expecting to run the show, and they also expected a lot of money, which we didn't right. have. So that that was another thing. So Washington wrote you know, Congress right before that and said, "No more. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're disrupting my whole command structure." Yeah. And that's what the Continental Congress did when. Lafayette basically knocked on the, on the hall door there in, in Philadelphia at the beginning of all because that here I am and they told him to go home. Yeah. And he was really a, a big deal in Europe. It was big news when Lafayette left France. He is under arrest, I think. He the king really had uh, you know a problem with him because if you go, you kind of back up France really wanted us to, to beat up on Great Britain because France had just been defeated in the Seven Years' War by Great Britain. But France was not strong enough to really challenge Great Britain directly head on head. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of working a little bit behind the scenes back then. And here you had um, Lafayette, one of the richest men in, in France, young man because of the death of both of his mother and the father and the family background and was a member of the king's court and it was you know he was pretty well known and the king did not want him to come to america to help us out he had heard about us and actually from the brother of the king of england um during a dinner became so enthusiastic about the idea of individual freedom and individual rights that he was going to come over and help us. And he knew the king was not going to be very, you know, he was not going to support him in this. So he uh, decided to kind of do it by himself. And when the king heard about it, he sent his own troops out to arrest Lafayette. And Lafayette had a, made a daring escape actually from his own country bought his own boat with his own money 
and sailed to uh, to the United States and ended up in South Carolina. And then he makes his way to Philadelphia and he gets there and they say, no, thanks. Go home. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and he kind of persisted. He said, look, look what I've given up. You know, yeah. the king's after me. I've spent my money. You know, I left my young wife who and my mm -hmm. young child. And by the way, he forgot to tell her that he was leaving. And wow. uh, I, I love what I love some of his letters, but the yeah. one that he wrote to her on his way to to America was basically said, "Whoops, maybe I made a mistake. I hope you still love me. This is a good cause. Yeah. Don't blame me. You know, you'll like this." So you know, he gave up all this mm -hmm. to come to America, and uh, he had a little help from uh, Ben Franklin, mm -hmm. and, and you know, Franklin it was just amazing. He said. What are you doing in the Continental Congress? Here's a guy who's well known in France, and he has money. He can help us. What are you doing turning him away? And yeah. Congress eventually worked with Washington, and Washington thought he was going to be like an honorary commission, like mm -hmm. stand over there, little boy, and, and we'll fight the war. Yeah. But Lafayette, from the beginning, he wanted troops, and he wanted to be part of the battle. It's kind of interesting, even though he was a French officer, He'd never been in a battle in his life. Wow. So, you know, he had no military experience mm -hmm. even when, when he got here. So what happens? What's going on at Brandywine? Can you tell us why there is a battle there? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, this was not George Washington's idea of a battle. Um, Washington was doing as much as he could with the troops he had and the inexperienced troops of, you know, kind of keep him occupied, a little bit of hit and run, um, you know. Mm -hmm. He, he was not faring well in, in big battles against the big British army. And uh, it, it came that we were trying to get France and Spain in on our side, mm -hmm. and we had to prove ourselves, basically. And they expected us to defend our capital, Philadelphia, when mm -hmm. the British was making this attack to take over our you know, right. our seat of government. And also the Congress would say, hey, look, you can't abandon us. Stop the British. Mm -hmm. So Washington said, well, I got to do something, so I'd better find the best defensive position. And um, after, you know, back in d July, Hal left, General Hal left uh, New York City with this big armada and all these troops. And we were, Washington wasn't quite sure if he was going to go up north to help Burgoyne or go all the way south or attack Philadelphia when it became evident it was Philadelphia and they landed in the Chesapeake at the head of the Elk that it was going to be Philadelphia. So that's when he started finding the best position. Mm -hmm. And you had this Brandywine River. river. Um, and admittedly, it is not a, it's not like the Mississippi. Okay. But during that day, there was a lot of, during that time, there was a lot of rain. The water came up to the man's um, waist and Washington knew that that would slow him down coming across. So he set off doing his defense. And the problem with was that Washington didn't have really great information. Some of the locals tried to help him. I, I think he had a map that was done by his cartographer that was not very detailed. Mm. And he just showed several of the fords. And that's what Washington did to set his defense. He had General Sullivan all the way up on the right flank. And he thought, come on, General Hal, you push a crossing and I can defeat you right here. And that was Washington's plan on September 11th. Mm -hmm. The problem is the British and Hal had some loyalists that knew the country much better. And one of them said, follow me, I'll take you on a, the left flank and get you around Washington's army. And uh, on the early morning, a little over half of them with Howe and Cornwallis did that flanking mar march mm. of 14, 15 miles uh, around the flank. And they sent the other half under the uh, Hessian Kneiphausen. And his orders were push the Americans back to the Brandywine, make them think you have the whole army in front of you. And when you hear us attacking back, we'll attack across the, the, mm. the Brandywine and we'll catch you in the middle. Mm. And it, it almost was, worked because yeah. a couple of the British officers wrote in their journals, if we had another two hours of daylight, there wouldn't have been a George Washington's army left. So, you, you know, that was happening. Washington was going nuts during the days mm -hmm. with Daft and his staff. Why can't somebody tell me what's going on out there? I don't know. You know, where are they? Mm -hmm. he, Washington had been beaten the, the year before at 
you know, Brooklyn, Long Island, New York, yeah, whatever yeah. you want to call the battle, by the flanking movement. And he knew this was possible. It wasn't like Washington was caught totally unaware, but he was getting conflicting information mm -hmm. from his scouts. So some of them said nobody here. Other ones said we saw them. They weren't dated and timed perfectly, so and they were coming in at different times. So it was kind of hard to piece together exactly mm -hmm. what was going on. And at noon, uh, one of the staff officers recorded Washington just said, you know, somebody's got to tell me what's going on. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So you had this great confusion. You mm -hmm. had Lafayette with Washington all morning going up and down, doing, you know, with the orders that he can, doing whatever mm -hmm. Washington asked him to do, very much being a, a staff officer. Mm -hmm. um, the, and then what happened, you know, the flanking movement was finally discovered. There was a guy named Squire Cheney. I always liked him. He became a yeah. squire afterwards. And he, he gave the alarm to Washington and said, you know, you're being outflanked. And Washington said, you know, we got professional scouts out there. And he said, no, you're being outflanked. And, and mm -hmm. Washington accused him of being a spy. Finally, it came in. The information was verified. And Washington tried to move the, the right flank Sullivan's army from the river and kind of hooked it mm -hmm. to the area of uh, Battle Hill, Birmingham Hill. The, and there, there's a Quaker meeting house, Birmingham meeting house there, and tried to line it up. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were, happen to be you know standing up there with, with uh, Sullivan's troops and you looked a little bit to the north at the Osborne Hill, you saw a grand sight and a lot of them mentioned it. They're all the British army kind of lined up on Osborne Hill, all their different colors, mm -hmm. you know, the Hessians and, and the drums beat and they just started that march off that hill towards mm -hmm. uh, Washington's army and-, and the, the grand uh, sight unless they're coming after oh, you. Absolutely, yeah. you know, might be good then you run, I guess. And that's sort of what some of the Americans did. They had mm -hmm. trouble getting in line, some of them, especially the right flank, just kind of crumbled, mm -hmm. and it looked like it was a major disaster. And that's when, back at, um, you know, with Washington, Lafayette was told what was going on, and he went up and said, give me permission to go up and help. And that's when Washington said, I think he probably just looked around, we need all the help we can, mm -hmm. go ahead. And, and, you know, the young 20-year-old with a couple of his staff officers you know, beat it the, the mile and a half as fast as they could and mm -hmm. found General Conway's brigade. Mm -hmm. And he was a little bit to the west of the Birmingham meeting house. Uh, we we're trying to figure out exactly where Lafayette was wounded. And, of course, we can't get down to the blade of grass, but we yeah. knew basically where Conway was in that line of defense. So Lafayette gets there. He sees all this commotion, all the problems, some of the Americans retreating, he gets off his horse. You know, he's not like the general that just kind of stands mm -hmm. in the background and sort and give orders. He gets off, tries to straighten the line, tries to get this, um, uh, you know, bayonet charge, something to stop it. And mm -hmm. as he's doing this, he's shot in the left leg mm -hmm. and the bullet goes all the way through. And this is the moment, really, I think, where it starts, where he becomes an American hero. And what he does for us later on, it, it just ensures our freedom or give us a fighting chance for the freedom. He continues for a little bit. And one of his aides says, General, you're bleeding. Your, your, your boots filling up with blood. We got to get you out of there. Mm -hmm. They got him back on his horse. They, they got him back to the tree line and back of Conway's troops where he received some initial medical help. And from there they said, you know, we got to get you ahead of the retreat. Mm -hmm. And he starts making his way back to that Chester that night. He, he was still helping the armies yeah. goes back because, you know, the retreat after being defeated like this, and it was a major British victory, mm -hmm. they, they, he was trying to get them in line so they would um, you know, be sort of orderly. And right. that's what he was doing. But he mm -hmm. still needed medical treatment. I mm -hmm. did a lot of uh, the research from Lafayette's personal memoirs. And he talks about that night, um, you know, trying to help everything. Mm. And they take him into a home to get the doctor to look at him. And they put him on a kitchen table and start getting him ready to take care of the wound. And some of the officers he knew came in to see how he was doing. Mm -hmm. 
And he just kind of looked at him and he said, I, I know you guys have had a hard day and you're hungry, but I'm not part of the dinner, you know, even <laughs> though I'm on the kitchen table. And, you know, it's, it's just a great line that it, it has is. In, it is. in the memoirs. And, um, you know, the, the casualties were almost twice as many on the Americans mm. and mm. You know, Lafayette uh, needed to recoup. And mm. the, it's what's such a personal character, mm. as mm. you can tell. And he made yes. friends and he finally makes his way. He was taken to Philadelphia that night and then up to Bethlehem to, to recover. And, of course, mm. the Continental Congress had to flee Philadelphia. Yeah. And the road was open for the British to come mm. in. They went to Lancaster, then to York for the winter, mm. and Lafayette's in Bethlehem getting, you know, getting treated. And he wanted to rejoin Washington as soon as he could, and, mm -hmm. and probably came back and, and joined him uh, before Valley Forge a little bit sooner than he mm. should have. Well, we're talking with Bruce Mauday, who is the author of Lafayette at Brandywine, The Making of an American Hero, uh, a book that tells the story about Lafayette and about his critical moment in the Battle of Brandywine, right. which is really, a, it's a defeat for the Americans, but Lafayette emerges from it with a military reputation, which he won't lose during the war. Absolutely. Bob, the reason I, I, I really did this book, you got to back up a few years ago, and there was no book on the Battle of Brandywine. Right. My, I, I did a book September 11th, which was you know look at it before anybody really started doing it. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through and I was detailing everything that happened, um, you know, I was thinking we always want to know what what did we do well that day. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, you know, the idea at the around the Brandywine, well, you know, they stood two to toe with the British for a couple hours, and they took that thought back to. Uh, Valley Forge made him a better soldiers. And the more I thought about that in the years afterwards, I said, no, it doesn't make much sense. You know, if they're going to remember a fight, you, you know, you, you won up Saratoga just recently. You know, if you're going to remember a defeat, you had the Paoli massacre. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you had a lot of other things. And, and, you know, and that was not the reason they became better soldiers. And then I said, there had to have been something else. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I had mentioned before the show started that the books usually tell me or they yes. kind of inspire me to write it. And my mind kept coming back for a long time. Lafayette, look at Lafayette, mm -hmm. look at Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And if you read the books on Lafayette and, and the American Revolution, they basically say Lafayette was there and he was wounded, nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Um, I said, no, nah, there's more to this. And then I found out that Washington almost kicked me back what he gave up to get here and what he did later. Mm -hmm. And then it came to me, you know, this really started on that afternoon of September 11th when he was wounded. Because, yeah. Like I said before then, nobody knew who he was. Right. And so this really kind of kind of kicked him off. Right. Now, you also, said go ahead, Bob. You, you said he spoke a little English. Right. Was he able to communicate with the? He must have been able to communicate with the soldiers. After a while, he became very, you know, fluent, and he was a very smart guy. When he left uh, France, he knew very little. One of the um, generals that came over with him was uh, General de Kalb, and who later de died uh, fighting for freedom, and he, he's very well known around mm -hmm. the Valley Forge area. But de Kalb had worked with the French army and the French government before, had been in America during the French and Indian War, and he really helped him to kind of mm -hmm. kickstart his learning of the English language. So he, he knew some, and he really worked at it, and you know, it's amazing. I think uh, from mm -hmm. all indications, it looks like um, you know, he became fluent pretty, pretty easily. Well, it's, ama it's an amazing story. We're talking with Bruce Mauday, the author of Lafayette at Brandywine, the making of an American hero. And thank you for mentioning also your book on the battle of Brandywine. Cause it is uh, I was just amazed that there was no battle. Here was the major battle, but I had found, I think I figured out why. Uh, I did some research in London at the uh, public records office, mm -hmm. like our national archives. And I came in there and I said, I want to do some research on the American Revolution. And they said, yes, yes, we've heard of that. Yeah. And when I, in, the, you know, in that tone, and when I asked about the Battle of the Brandywine, one of their major victories, they said, don't know anything about that. And they, but they did have wow. some information in their files. So, you know, the, you know, the British 
yeah, there was a blimp on their history. They don't talk yeah. much about it. Uh, and if you look on the other side, uh, we got def- even though we won the war, we were defeated there. Washington got beat the same way that the year before. Mm-hmm. So he didn't talk about it much. Right. So I, I think that's why war- why Brandy Wine mm-hmm. yeah got kind of lost in history yeah. or second rate. But if you really look what happened with Lafayette, they deserve to be mm-hmm. up there yeah. and, and really recognized. Right. And, and and of course the Philadelphia campaign in many ways because what Washington realizes Philadelphia isn't something we need to hold he needs to keep right. the army together yes and then so that's a loss and it's overshadowed then by Saratoga which right. is uh, a victory for the American side um, yeah and, and you know. It, and Washington was correct. He, he was great at keeping the army together. And I think he, he realized right at the beginning the Lafayette's value because mm-hmm. we were really trying to you know get French involved and he was going to be our champion in France in, in the coming years. And also once we got the support, every time there was an issue with the French allies, you know, Lafayette was there to help him mm-hmm. and Lafayette really supported Washington. I think, you know, it's, they, people were very close when they said that you know, it was almost a father-son relationship. Mm-hmm. If you read the letters and back and forth yeah. and, and Lafayette naming his son George Washington Lafayette, there mm-hmm. definitely it was that, that kind of connection there. And Lafayette was so loyal. Um, that winter at Valley Forge after he recuperated uh, General Gates and, some, and Conway, uh, Conway mm-hmm. Cabal, wanted Washington out and they wanted to lessen Lafayette's standing in America. So they you know, did a politically devised plan to, to invade Canada. Yeah. Okay. You really want to invade Montreal in the dead of winter with you know, a couple of undermanned troops and Lafayette at your head and Lafayette mm-hmm. knew what was going on and informed his father-in-law, which got back to the King and Congress mm-hmm. saying, Hey, look, not my idea. These guys are nuts. And, and yeah. it sort of backfired on the cabal. And mm-hmm. it really just strengthened that relationship between Lafayette yeah. and Washington. Yeah, it, it's hard for us to imagine this political infighting going on, that there's this move by Conway and Gates to oust Washington, actually supported by members of Congress. Who, yes, some of them. So yeah. and, and also, you know, when Lafayette first was coming over, there, there were some of the people in France that, you know, we think a French general should be in charge of the American troops and not Washington. So it was also external in France mm-hmm. and internal with them that yeah. uh, <clears throat> wanted to, to ask Washington. But Washington, you know, he, he kept everybody together. He had the faith. You know, you, you look what happened in you know, Christmas in, in 76. The army was, you know, that close yeah. to being mm. destroyed. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking with Bruce Mauday about his new book on Lafayette at Brandywine. And of course, when Lafayette comes back 50 years later, the United States sends him home on a ship called the Brandywine. Yes, no, no, that, no. I, I, I think that, that is great. And, you know, just I didn't do a biography of Lafayette. Mm-hmm. You know, it would take 20 yeah. volumes, I think, yeah. to touch everything. So I, I kept it to the American Revolution, the Brandywine, and the effect and what happened. Mm-hmm. And I wrote about it, that return. And, and he did return to uh, Chad's Ford and where mm-hmm. the Battle of the Brandywine was. And, you know, can, can you imagine anybody today being – celebrated for 13 months day yes. after day with you know parades and dinners and speeches and everything but that you know that's the impact he had yeah. you know 50 years after the american mm-hmm. revolution people knew what lafayette did for us and he was greatly honored mm-hmm. and um the, there's just a lot of information about lafayette's return trip mm-hmm. you know all through massachusetts you know was one of the first we landed in new york and came up to boston mm-hmm. you know, right at the beginning and he yeah. was ready to go home that um the end of that year and they said no no you can't because the rest of the country wants you to visit so yeah. you know he, he stayed and, and it was he, just an amazing show really was he visited every state and he laid the cornerstone yep. for the bunker hill monument yes he, it, it was wrecked in a steam i mean it's a, that's a great story too i don't i it don't is. know if that's the story telling you you want they want you to tell it next but it might be i'm, I'm looking for it for that one it maybe it is actually that whole trip by lafayette was amazing he, he was in a uh, accident on a boat on the ohio river that sunk 
Mm. And, you know, at one point they thought uh, they had trouble getting him off the boat and mm -hmm. he was afraid that his son had died, George Washington Lafayette, mm -hmm. but he, everybody ended up safe. Um, mm -hmm. If I can, you know, there was just one moment that I think yeah. really kind of captures Lafayette and what he did for us. Uh, it was an unscheduled stop outside of Norfolk, Virginia. There was some issue with the horse or the buggies or something, and there was a tavern owner who came up, wrote Welcome Lafayette on chalk on, 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 on his tavern wall, and said, do you have a second to talk to my wife and my child? Of course, Lafayette said yes, and the, the young boy just put his hand on Lafayette and said, I can't thank you enough that you did for the freedom for me and my family in this country. What a great moment. Mm -hmm. And Lafayette's secretary who chronicled all this trip oh, said yeah. that was the moment that Lafayette really remembered. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me as, as such also. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's just an amazing yeah. So Lafayette still has a way of captivating us. I mean, uh, uh, those of us who look into him, can you tell us right. a bit about the reaction you have had to? Yeah, it, you know, um, working, of course, at Barricade Books, my publisher and and the book designer and um, Carmela Cohen, and she, she's great. And after it was finished, because he was working manuscript and designing the books, he said, you know, you made me love Lafayette. And... You know, I think that's what we need to do is look, look what this guy gave up. And it's not, yeah. not only here, but, you know, he wanted to instill American style freedom in France. And then mm -hmm. you have the whole French Revolution. Mm -hmm. He ends up in prison. His wife almost goes to the guillotine. Some members of the family did. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a whole nother volumes mm -hmm. and volumes oh, yeah. over there. And he sometimes called, and I don't think it's quite right, you know, the hero of two worlds. Mm -hmm. I think he's a hero over here, and I think most of us recognize that in France, he's not always considered as such because of his role in, in the French Revolution. Right. He got kind of caught in the middle. The king didn't want to lose their powers. The the commoners didn't quite trust him because, you know, he was associated with the king, and that put him in a, in a really tough position. So, you know, you get that. Um, you know, if you go almost any place in the United States, you'll find something named for Lafayette, a town, a village, a county here in, in, in Pennsylvania, streets, everything. But when I really talk to the people, a lot of them say that's about as far as it goes. Yeah, they know yeah. Lafayette, they know they helped him, but you know they, they don't know about Brandywine. They don't know about yeah. being wounded. They don't know about his great mm -hmm. defense of Washington. They don't know about him really kind of uh, keeping the, the allies together or what he did. We didn't even talk about what happened in Virginia and how he was the one responsible for cornering Cornwallis right. at Yorktown, which was really the last major battle of the American right. Revolution. Really we're, we're talking with Bruce Mowday about his new book on Lafayette. One of my favorite moments is at the surrender at Yorktown yeah. when the British troops are marching past, looking at the French side. They don't want to acknowledge that the Americans have beaten them. Right. And Lafayette, who's leading American troops, has his band strike up Yankee Doodle. <laughs> that is such a great moment. He was also the one, um, you know, Cornwallis didn't want to surrender his sword to the Americans. and. Yeah. And they were instrumental in Lafayette saying, nope, over there, do it yeah. to, to General Lincoln. You know, you, you humiliated him early in the war. You surrendered to him and an American. And, yeah. and, you know, it's just a great, great minute down there. really is. Really is. So we have, uh, uh, we're talking with Bruce Mowday about his book on Lafayette at Brandywine, a little known battle until we read your book. Uh, with I David. hope that's true. That's right, Bob. <laughs> yes, I, so. So, so you are from Chester County, Pennsylvania, and most of your work is focused on, well, your historical work. You've written true crime books. You've written about sports. You had a career as a journalist before right. turning to writing history. Um, so how is it that you develop an idea for a book? Um, usually the books just come to me and say, write it. I've done three books on Gettysburg. I had, wasn't going to do any of them. But I was up one day at the end of Pickett's Charge, and I realized there was nothing written on the Union defenders that basically saved our country again that day mm -hmm. and called the publisher to do that. Um, you know, even the sports book, and I, I actually started life as a sports reporter many years ago. 
I was down at the Phillies ballpark and talking to this usher who just retired and he just loves his, you know, his retirement yes. job. And he asked me what I did. I write books. He said, I have a book for you. I get told that a lot, usually yeah. not, but this was it. He was the head of the uh, Why the Hall Not campaign that helped get Richie Ashburn, oh. the most beloved ball player in Philadelphia. A lot of mm -hmm. people say that, and I saw him, and he's a great announcer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from that chance meeting that, you know, the Richie Ashburn book came out again, it was just kind of there. It had, you know, it had to be written. Um, the Battle mm -hmm. of the Brandywine, you know, my first book, I was uh, writing for the Daily Local News where I was a courthouse reporter, then a managing editor. And I did columns and uh, through a, a newspaper auction, I received a firsthand account of somebody who wrote with Pulaski and Washington at Brandywine, oh, wow. and it was, what an image, and, and yeah. then I said, I'm going to write a column, and I, yeah, I knew the history, and I know mm -hmm. a lot, and when I asked for a book on the Battle of Brandywine, there wasn't any, and that really got me in, uh, into doing that one, so they all, you know, they all kind of come, mm -hmm. and, and they'll tell me to write them. Well, that's great, that's great, and I, I hope they keep coming. Um, Thank you. <laughs> So, I, you yeah. know, I love people's stories, and they're usually yeah. based like this Lafayette or you know, or a General Webb from uh, at Pickett yeah. Stark. You know, what we do makes history. I, you mm -hmm. know, dates and times you got to put together, you know, to keep everything. But man, history it, history is very personal for really me. Is. It's, it really is the stories of people, which yes. you tell very well. So. We've been talking with Bruce Mauday, who from um, Chester County, Pennsylvania, about his latest book, Lafayette at Brandywine. And I want to thank Bruce for joining us and for thank writing. Thank you for book. having me, Bob. I, I really I wanna, loved it. I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, the man behind the curtain who does the real heavy lifting, and all of our many listeners. You know, Bruce, when we started doing these podcasts, we thought, you know, we'll have people in and around Boston. We actually right. have listeners all over the world. So that uh, that is great. And the story yeah. needs to be told. Really and exactly. good for you guys for doing yeah. this. Singapore and Thailand and even Cuba, the Virgin Islands, and folks here at home too. And we have a lot of Lafayette fans listening. And I know there good. will be many more once they hear this and once they read your book. And now Jonathan will help pipe us out on the road to Boston with Doug Quigley and Peter and Dave Emmerich. So thank you, thank you, Bruce, for joining thank us. Thank you again. Thanks thank to everybody you. out there.